worshiping with us. Would you join us and sing? Bienvenidos hermanos y hermanas. Welcome once again, brothers, sisters, and siblings in Christ to Mission Church of the Nazarene. My name is Jeff Birdsell, and boy, we've got a lot going on this week, uh, coming up especially on October 31st, heading into November 1st. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things you can be doing to prepare throughout the week, and then what's going on on the 31st and the 1st. So throughout this week, you are welcome to swing by the church between 9 and 4 and pick up a goodie bag for a family game night, a not-so-spooky Halloween activity. And you can pick up one for a family on your block or some folks that you know who are looking for a good way to celebrate uh, Halloween in this socially distanced environment. So you can come on by the church, like I said, between 9 and 4, Monday through Friday, heading into next week. Uh, if those times don't work, you need to reach out. You can contact Beth in the church office and schedule a time that might work a little bit better for you. Uh, you would also want to, if you're swinging by the church between 9 and 4, Monday through Friday, pick up communion elements because on November 1st, we're going to be celebrating communion once again together in our um, outdoor service, but also in our online space. If you're not swinging by the church, you're welcome to prepare the elements uh, as you would at home, uh, however you like, whichever combination of cracker and beverage uh, you would like to do, go for it, and we'll, we'll celebrate together that on November 1st. So like I said, that's throughout the week, kind of getting ready, picking up supplies, materials. Uh, October 31st, you have that great uh, ha ha happy have Halloween fun time at home, and your neighbors do too. Uh, and then on November 1st, again, we'll be celebrating communion. That's also a day where we turn the clocks back, and either you get an extra hour of sleep or an extra hour of explaining to your kids why they should still be asleep. And November 1st is also when we really begin kicking off our 
uh, our activities for collecting those backpack supplies uh, for Foster Elementary School. Uh, and so uh, those cost about $40. If you're interested, you can gather up the materials yourself and bring them to the church. Or if you'd prefer, you can send a donation into the church office and for $40, uh, and we will go ahead and have someone uh, pack those supplies up for you kind of on your behalf. So that's a lot going on this week. Uh, more than anything, though, in the midst of all that's going on, we pray for God's peace on your life, uh, the feeling of blessing and security that comes from knowing Him and letting Him be the ruler of your life so that you can go on and give that blessing and pass it on to others. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. through the giving of our tithes and offerings. I would invite you to visit missionnaz.org and you can give your tithes and offerings there. Let us pray. Lord, we are so thankful. We praise you. We love you. And this morning as we give back to you, Lord, we ask that you would receive it, that you would multiply it, and that you would use it to build your kingdom here. And we'll give you all the praise. We love you, Lord. Amen.
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for that powerful name. And in that name, we find everything we need, everything in this life and the life to come. We thank you for your words, your spirit. And as we gather together, may we focus on your truth in the name of our great Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning and welcome. Before we begin in God's Word, I want to remind you that uh, next Sunday will be the first Sunday of our Faith Promise Emphasis. We'll be on the 1st and the 8th dealing with uh, our Faith Promise for missions here at home and around the world. And on the 1st will also be Communion Sunday. If you're worshiping at home, if you'd like to come by the church office and pick up communion elements, you're welcome to do that at any time during office hours, and if not, just have uh, the substitutes for those communion elements there at home and share with us on the Sunday the 1st. This morning we want to go right back into John chapter 17, where we've been in the prayer uh, of Jesus. We looked at Jesus praying to the Father in that intimate moment, the time has fully come, now is the time for me to return to glory. He talked in verse 4 about completing the work that God had given him to do. And then he went on to say what that work had been. He said, I've given them your very name, your nature. I've given them your words, given them your glory, both in substance and in radiance. He said he had given us protection and also a commission to go into the world and share this good news. Last week, we looked at Jesus' prayer for his disciples in the middle section of the prayer. And he defined disciples as those who belong to him, who obey his words. And because of that obedience, they know him, they belong to him, and they're in the world, but not of the world. This morning, we want to look at the, the closing part of the prayer where Jesus speaks about all those who will believe through their message. That comes down to us, the church, and all that God has in store for us. Let me just reemphasize Jesus knows that in a few hours, he will be going to his cross. 
He is sharing with his disciples these last minute instructions. He's entrusting the church into their hands, but he's telling them they're not ready for that yet. He knows they're not ready. He says, tarry in Jerusalem until you're filled with my very spirit. I have lived with you, now I will live within you. We've been talking a lot about that spirit earlier in these upper room discourses in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and now in the prayer in chapter 17. And so Jesus is wrapping up his purpose for his church, and we want to see these verses. In each of the other sections, we have lifted out specific verses where Jesus speaks of what he has prayed for for himself and his purpose for his disciples. And now for us, in verse 11, he says, Father, protect them so they may be one just as we are one. In verse 13, give them the full measure of my joy. Verse 15, protect them from the evil one. And verses 17, 18, and 19, he talks about this idea of holiness. He says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Just as I have sanctified myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Let's pick it up there in verse 20 and read the close of the prayer. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me will be in them and I myself may be in them. Jesus says in that 24th verse that his ultimate desire is that we, the bride of Christ, would be with him in glory, to see him in his glory, the glory that has been his since before the creation of the world. But he gives us four things, this side of heaven, that he wants for the church. These are Jesus' four main concerns from the prayer of what he wants believers to possess and to exude out to our world. They are these. He prays that we will have holiness, that we will have unity, that we will have his love and his joy. How does that measure up with our priorities in the church? Let's start with that call to holiness. We've talked quite a bit about this last month in the earlier chapters where Jesus was introducing to the disciples the fact that he was going to send another of the exact same kind who would live within them, who would lead them into all truth. And so he says we should be holy. And so we've taken that word holy, and and really the the word hagios in the Greek doesn't really translate all the way through into English, and so we have several terms that we've brought from that one term. We have holy and holiness, but in English it doesn't really have a good verb form. We don't do holify or holification. And so scripture has been translated into English using words like sanctity and sanctify and sanctification. We recognize that purifying life of what God does among us. But the word itself means mature, complete, and as we said last week, being set aside for a spiritual purpose. God longs that we would be sanctified, that we would be purified, that we would be completely given to him. And so what it means more than anything is we really need to be different by the basis of the fact that we belong to him. That changes us. It changes everything. I belong completely to him, and he says he will dwell within me. And so that difference is because we have been with God. We are his. Our will, our heart, our very selves are devoted to his service. Now the word tells us that God is holy. If you were doing an equation, it would be God equals holy, just as God equals love. It's his very nature. It's not just an added on characteristic. If I were describing my wife to you, I'd say, okay, she's about this tall, and she has hazel eyes and brown hair. Oh, oh, and she's holy. (laughs) It's another characteristic. 
But with God, it is his very nature. We are only holy as we are in connection with God, who is the essence of holiness. It's basic to his otherness. And so we stand in awe, in awe of his splendor and majesty, the the mystery of his unsearchable riches. And so we recognize that the word speaks to us that things or persons become holy only by virtue of their relationship to the holy God. I brought a little stone from my yard. Back in the midst of our heat wave a week and a half ago, I picked up a stone just like this in the center divider between our driveway and the neighbors, and I could not grip it in my hand. It was so hot from the heat of the sun, which was over 100 degrees that day. If I had gripped it like this, it would have burned my hand. But now, it's been in my pocket. (laughs) It's room temperature. See, this is not hot by its very nature. It was only hot because it was in the sun, and the sun made it hot. I am not holy by my original nature. I only become holy by my relationship to God as he infills me, as he makes me holy. And so we have this sanctifying relationship, and we become holy. Indeed, the word says, be holy as I am holy. Somewhere on Mount Horeb, there is the spot where Moses spoke to God at the bush that was burning but was not being consumed. And God said to Moses, take off your sandals, Moses. The place where you are standing is holy ground. It was not holy before, and it is not holy since, except in the memory of Moses and those who thank the Lord for what he talked to Moses about that day. The ground was holy only as it related to God and his revelation. And so holy ground is where you meet God. I think of two places from my childhood. The campground where as an eight-year-old boy I knelt and received Christ as my Savior. That place is now sold, unused, overgrown, and yet it's holy ground for me in my memory. My little church altar, where I knelt so many times, is now a freeway on-ramp where the property is. We had to move the church to another location. And so those holy ground places are places in my memory that are sacred because of where I met God. And this same holy God who meets us at those mountaintop occasions of our lives is also the God who lives within us. He is Emmanuel, God with us, and he is the Holy Spirit, God within us. And so we are different by virtue of belonging to God. Israel belonged utterly and completely to God. They had no place apart from the call of God, no existence apart from the call of God. God God called Abram, and he preserved Isaac, and he made his covenant with Jacob, and he protected Joseph. He called Moses. He led them out of Egypt, spoke to them on Sinai and in the wilderness. He created them. He loved them, he chose them, and he protected them. And he does the same for us. And God says to the people of Israel, will you belong to me? And they said, yes, we will. And then he said, all right, then the quality of your life should reflect that belongingness. And so our quality of life should change because we belong to God. Israel's prophets told them, don't depend on political alliances, depend upon God." And Israel was nothing apart from the calling of God, and so we, the church, are nothing apart from the calling of God and his redeeming work within us. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And so God didn't love Israel or us because we were smart or great or beautiful or wise or good. He loved us because we needed love, and he is love. And so we graciously receive that love. So whatever holiness means, it means radical belonging to God. The old self is crucified, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Death to the old self and given this new life. Do a a Bible study in Romans chapter 8, if you like, this week. That will teach you what that means to die out to self and selfishness and to live for God. At the core of our holiness is that we don't belong to self, we don't belong to the world, but we belong radically and completely to God. There's a pattern of self-life which is natural to us, which must be broken, that we might belong to him. 
And so we are made holy by virtue of that belonging. Made different by the way that that belonging shows then in our lives. Two verses in 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 15 and 16, where he says, Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. God is holy, we are his, we are to live holy lives. Now, for Israel, the commandments came after this declaration of belonging. It wasn't, okay, here are the commandments, if you can keep those, then you will deserve to belong to me. No, you have declared that you belong to me, now I will give you guidelines as to how to live that life before you. And so the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, shows us the way that we should go. And so God gave them regulations and laws to set them apart so that all of their lives would relate to their belonging. And so sanctification, whatever else we have done with that term, is dying and a yielding point of complete declaration that I belong to God. Everything that I am, everything I ever will be. Holiness is to be Christ-like. And so we seek to be like Jesus. We can't do that by ourselves any more than the disciples could do it by themselves. He said, now, now that you know these things, tarry in Jerusalem, you will be filled with the power of the Spirit, and then you will be my witnesses. And for us, he fills us, he enables us, he empowers us. We cannot do that on our own, but he will live within us. And whatever else we need, we need holiness. We need to be a people belonging to God and a people whose actions reflect that belonging. The quality of life reflects that belonging to God, to be like Jesus. Remember, John Wesley's favorite definition of sanctification was to be so filled with love that there's just no room for anything else. To allow that love to just take us over. Let me read you the words of A.K. Miller's hymn, I Have One Deep Supreme Desire, that I may be like Jesus. To this I fervently aspire, that I may be like Jesus. I want my heart his throne to be, so that a watching world may see his likeness shining forth in me. I want to be like Jesus. In the third verse, in the fourth verse rather, he says, his spirit fill my hungering soul, his power all my life control, my deepest prayer, my highest goal, is that I might be like Jesus. And so we seek to be Christ-like. His prayer for his church is that we would be holy. And then he prays that we would be one, that we would be united, just as he and the Father are one. Unity, oneness has been a theme of Jesus' prayer right from the start. In verse 11, the first petition he has for believers is that they would be one. He repeats it here in verse 21, that they may be one just as we are one. How does that get a hold of your heart about what our unity is supposed to look like? We are to be one in the family of God just as the Father and the Son are one. We need to express that unity by our lives. We are not united by our race or our culture or our language or the country we come from. We are united by the love of Christ, and we are one in him. A common sharing of the life of Jesus, that's what unites us. And so our unity is a high priority for Jesus. Is it a high priority for us? It must be seen, it must be felt, it must be behaved among us if we are to demonstrate what Christ prays that we would be. Not by nodding our heads, but by action. Not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. God is concerned that nothing would divide us. And so often, tiny things seem to threaten to divide us. All the spiritual gifts were given that we might be united in the family of God. And yet, some little thing comes up and we're ready to be splintered all to pieces by Satan. Gifts are given for uniting, and so get those gifts into action, be that teaching or serving or encouraging or equipping or hospitality, whatever it is that God has given you, use it for the unity in the body of Christ and then reaching out to our world. 
Now, Paul said here there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. We are one in Christ. Think, for example, about the Philippian church. You can read about the forming of that church in Acts chapter 16. When Paul and his companions came to town, there was not a Jewish synagogue, so they went down to the Bible study by the river that was led by Lydia, a rich Jewish merchant who traded in fine cloth. And Lydia was the first convert in all of Europe. This was the first time the church had come out of Asia when they land there in Macedonia. Lydia is the first one. And then Paul begins preaching in the streets. The second convert is a demon-possessed slave girl. <laughs> Paul casts the demon out, and she is cleansed. She is converted. She becomes a believer. As a result of that, and her owners losing their revenue, Paul and Silas are thrown into prison. They're praising the Lord at midnight, and the earthquake comes, and the jailer thinks they've escaped. He's about to take his life, and Paul says, wait, wait, we're here, we're all here. The jailer is amazed. He said, what must I do to know your Savior? The third convert is this Roman official. We've got a rich Jewish female merchant. We've got a demon-possessed slave girl who has now been cured and healed, and we've got a Roman soldier now keeping a jail. They become the church. Not uniformity, but unity. God doesn't call us to be all alike. He calls us to be united in all of our differences. In chapter 1 of Philippians, Paul says to them, I thank God for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Right from the beginning, there was a unity among them, even though they were as different as people could be in the midst of their community. But now listen, this is about unity. This is not so we will just feel great about who we are as church. Unity is with a purpose. It says that we might be united so that the world may believe. The world may see our unity, and they may say there's something special about that. I want to be a part of that. The unity of the church is God's marketing plan. <laughs> he says, go and express your unity. They will see that you are mine, and they'll want a part of that that the world may see that you are Lord by the unity of his church. We see that in depth in there in verses 21, 2, and 3, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may be also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. We demonstrate the life of Christ so that others will be drawn. Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And so we begin to recognize this truth. I in them, you in me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. Jesus said, I send them into the world just like you sent me into the world, Father, and now they're going to testify to your goodness by the unity that holds them together. He prays that we would be holy, that we would be united, and now he prays that we would be loving, filled with his love. Love is something that we do. It's an action. It's an expression of our recognized unity. It's an affirmation of the people around us to tell them that they are loved. There was an early Gaither chorus called, I am loved. I am loved. I am loved. I can risk loving you for the one who knows me best loves me most. I am loved. You are loved. Won't you please take my hand? We are free to love each other because we are loved. We love because he first loved us. And so we can be content and secure enough to pass that love on to others. We talked last week about saying yes to the world around us, saying yes to the, the world that needs to know the love of God. Not saying that we agree on everything, just saying yes to people. E. Stanley Jones, that great lifelong missionary, had served so long and so well and was leveled by a debilitating stroke that took away his power of speech. But for me, his most powerful book of all of his writings was the last one that he painstakingly dictated to his daughter, though his powers of speech were almost gone, she could barely understand what he was saying, but what he dictated became his book, The Divine Yes. And in that book, he says to his daughter, 
All of my life I've been preaching sermons, but now I get to live a sermon. We are a living sermon to the world in which we come in contact. We share the love of Christ by the way we live, by our unity and by the love that we show. This is how they'll know my disciples, by the way you love each other. And so we recognize the importance of that love. And so it's not just love that we build up. Jesus says, I love the Father, the Father loves me, and we love you. Therefore, you are to love each other. Do you notice the Bible never says, God loves you, therefore you should love God. The Bible says, God loves you, therefore you should love others. That's how we express our love for God, by loving others. But it's not our love, it's His love living within us, His Holy Spirit. This unconditional agape love that only He can engender into our lives is what flows through us to a needy world. That's the kind of love that Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 13 when he says, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And then he says, love never fails. And we wait and say, wait, our love has failed a lot. The meaning in the context there is not that love will never stumble and fail. It says, love never fails to keep loving. Love will always protect and trust and hope and persevere. And what would happen in our world if we, as the body of Christ, would just decide, I will not quit loving no matter what. I will love with the love of Jesus into my world. Life-changing miracles can happen. And so another tidbit of a song to transition us from love into joy in uh, Henry Van Dyke's great hymn to Beethoven's tune, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You. In verse 3, it says, teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. This love, when it's put into action, engenders joy. Now, don't get joy confused with happiness. Happiness rises and falls with circumstances. You ever say, how you doing? And say, oh, well, okay, under the circumstances. (laughs) What are we doing under the circumstances? God wants us to live above those circumstances. Because happiness can rise and fall with those circumstances, but joy is this steady gift of God. It's not a joy that we work up. Back in chapters 14 and 15, we looked at at Jesus' words where he said, give them in chapter 14, my peace. And in chapter 15, he says, give them my love. Give them my joy completely. It is his love, his joy living within us that we express to each other and to our world. And so joy is a result of that expression of love as we live it out in our world. Jesus said, may my joy be in you and your joy be complete. (laughs) And so we recognize that completion of joy. In verse 13 he says, give them the full measure of my joy. May it be overflowing in their lives. So God wants our very best. This road to joy, and all these fit together, this idea of holiness and unity and love and joy, is a progression as Jesus prays for us. Because holiness leads to unity. Unity is expressed in love. And that love results in joy. This is what Jesus prays for us, that we would be holy, that we would be one, even as he and the Father are one, that we would allow his love to so fill us that it would overflow onto everyone that we meet, and our joy would be contagious. These things should mark and define our lives. But Jesus says none of it is possible until we come to the words where he wraps up the prayer. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known by the continuing work of the Spirit in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and here's the key, that I myself may be in them. If we recognize 
that this is not something, you know, we get together and have a little Sunday pep talk and we're going to go out and be the church. We are only the church as he lives within us. We are the bride of Christ. He longs for us to be with him in glory. But that only happens as he lives within us now by his Holy Spirit. May we truly be the church this week as we identify what Jesus says in his prayer the church is all about. That we would be holy, united, and filled with love and joy. Father, we are yours. We give this day to you. We give this week to you. If this is the week you come for us, Father, we want to be found doing your work. Guide us. Give us strength in the midst of what is a trying time. May we sense your truth through your spirit into our lives. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you, keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and give you peace. His peace. The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. God bless you. Have a great day.